Welcome to BSG webinars, everyone. My name is Jake Keeler, VP of Marketing at BSG, coming to you from my home office in Egan, Minnesota. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, future episodes are posted on our websites. You can just go to bsgcraft.com slash webinars and find the uh, future episodes there. We can register and then past episodes are also linked there. Uh, next week, we have base malts with a story. Heirloom, terroir, and traditional malts, and an overview of the organic malt portfolio from Axel Janney, team leader, international customer consultant with Vireman Specialty Malts. That's going to be a really great talk. Again, that's next Thursday, uh, 1 p.m. Central Time. You can register for that webinar on our website. Uh, throughout today's webinar, please ask questions through the Q&A function. It's at the center of the toolbar down below. And we'll try to answer those during the Q&A session. If we don't get to those, we'll pass them on to our speaker. Uh, and those, uh, if you have additional questions, you can send those to webinars at bsgcraft.com. Today's speaker is Brandon Pierce, Quality Assurance and Compliance Manager at BSG. His talk today is titled Long-Term Ingredient Storage Tips. And with that, I'll hand it over to Brandon. Hi, thank you, Jake. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, today, we are going to talk about long-term storage uh, of ingredients, and let me share my screen. All right, so we are here. You've made it to the presentation. Uh, thanks again. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Brandon Pierce, uh, like Jake said, the QA and Compliance Manager for BSG, and I've been with BSG uh, since March 2017. Uh, and that was about the time uh, that uh, the ingredient sector of uh, the alcoholic beverages industry uh, was required to comply with FSMA uh, per the FDA uh, regulations. Uh, so, so I put together that program, which mean, means I was uh, responsible for the food safety management system, uh, which is uh, just uh, overall our policies, procedures, uh, all the forms and the records uh, that we have to comply with uh, FSMA. Uh, I'm also uh, responsible to help with pest management uh, in our bulk audit program. Uh, and, and so those are larger talk topics. We'll touch a little bit uh, on pest management, uh, but those are some larger topics maybe we can cover uh, in a webinar in the future. Uh, but today uh, we will uh, uh, stick to the point here. My professional background uh, is in uh, brewery quality lab uh, experience, ethanol uh, production. So I've been in the laboratory uh, and on the operation side at a um, industrial ethanol production facility. Uh, I was a production scientist uh, in the biotech industry. Uh, and then most recently before BSG, I uh, uh, was a food safety and quality manager uh, for a canned vegetable producer. Uh, one thing that all those uh, background that I have had in common was that there were uh, inputs uh, or ingredients that needed to be stored correctly. So uh, I've seen a lot of different types of storage uh, types. So flat storage, you know, refrigerated storage, freezer storage, negative uh, 80 degree storage. So lots of different uh, st storage techniques. So a little bit of uh, good experience in that, but today we're going to focus on brewing ingredients, right? Um, and some context. Uh, so the way that this pre presentation will proceed, we'll give some context here. We'll go into uh, uh, sort of our risks and our threats, some mitigation, uh, what to do when things go wrong, and then uh, we'll touch lastly on some resources before we do a Q&A. So the big question uh, you may all have on your mind is, has COVID-19 changed ingredient storage? Uh, and the answer, uh, is yes and a little bit no. Um, in, in terms of how it's affecting ingredient storage is that uh, uh, there are now rat turf wars in some larger metro areas. Uh, and I'm gonna pull up the headline uh, of that article. Uh, so hungry city rats are looking for a new lunch spot near you. Uh, as restaurants have shuttered, the rats who depend on an eternal garbage buffet are becoming more bold and competitive and looking for new homes. Uh, so that's, you know, a timely news story, uh, but it does uh, touch on something that is a very real challenge for everyone now is 
businesses have changed uh, how they're operating, and that does affect sort of the environment around us. Uh, rodents, if you're in a heavily populated area that has been around restaurants, you have some restaurant capacity at your operation, uh, you, you may see an increased pressure from some rodents. Uh, we'll touch on that in more detail later. Um, and the other main uh, way that this is affecting ingredient storage is that ingredients are being stored longer. Um, as demand for uh, products is potentially down, uh, the ingredients are being stored longer. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, on our side. I'm sure the uh, ingredient producers are seeing that on their side as well um, and then okay and so no this this is not uh, affecting ingredient storage right so there are some aspects that it's not affecting uh, the fundamentals are going to remain the same uh, and that's kind of what we'll talk about today is you know uh, bolstering our fundamentals and and some good things to think about uh, that protect us from some of the challenges that we have with COVID-19 uh, in terms of ingredient storage uh, and there's a BSG resource uh, on the web page. It's on uh, bsgcraft.com. It's uh, on the resources uh, section of, of the web page. Uh, and lastly, uh, let's keep this in mind that we're all in this together. Uh, and more than just uh, philosophically in terms of COVID-19, uh, with ingredient storage, uh, we're very tangibly uh, all in this together because the supply chain is, is uh, it's a good name. It's a chain, right? And so we're all interconnected. Um, the producers uh, of the ingredients are part of the chain. BSG as a distributor uh, is part of the chain. Uh, and you as the end user of the ingredients is part of the chain. So we are all in this together. Uh, and, and we got to remember to communicate uh, and all watch out for each other. And so that's what this opportunity to have this webinar is all about, uh, sharing some information. And we hope that we get some good questions. Uh, and so we'll proceed from there. So the way that this talk um, will work is we'll identify some potential risks and threats. Uh, we'll look at some mitigation. Uh, we'll look at sort of what to do when things go wrong. Um, we'll do, uh, I have a page on here that explains some resources that you can look to. Uh, and then at the very end, I think Jake will come back on and uh, we can do some question and answers. Uh, so potential risks and threats, right? So ingredients and the receipt process can be uh, a potential where you have risks and threats to your long-term ingredient storage. Uh, these are agricultural products by and large that you're using to make beer uh, or spirits uh, or, you know, in other cases, wine. Uh, we're primarily going to look at uh, some some more grain type things today. Um, so we have things like flaked, uh, puffed, torrified, milled, you know, pre-milled products potentially that you're all receiving. Uh, with some of the hazy beers, I, I think some of these types of products are more common. Uh, and they uh, represent a challenge because uh, they interact with the environment a little bit differently. Uh, they're, they're more available uh, to absorbing odors, to absorbing moisture, uh, and to absorbing some pests. And we'll talk about all those later, but uh, just the ingredient itself is more uh, susceptible to risk. Um, you could have multiple suppliers. So as you're looking at where you're buying ingredients from, if you identify an issue with products in your uh, facility or in your operation, it, it may be difficult in some cases, especially uh, potentially with pests, uh, to determine what supplier these came from. So uh, we can we can look at how we handle you know multiple suppliers, uh, ingredients from multiple suppliers that may be very similar. Uh, there's going to be inventory flow through your facility, so that can uh, we can have a, a risk or a threat there where. Uh, you know, you're receiving things. So how, how does that product flow through your facility, you know, physically? Uh, and what are you using first? Are you using, you know, first expired um, first? Or is it first in that you're using first, right? Uh, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Uh, pallets are come, you know, products are coming in uh, on pallets. The pallets themselves can uh, have a potential risk or a threat. 
Uh, and then there can be, you know, issues in the receipt process. So, you know, carriers, LTL, there can be damage. Uh, LTL is uh, less than truckload. So if you're uh, receiving things and they come on a carrier and that carrier is making multiple stops for different types of, uh, for different types of products or businesses and, you know, your, your pallet is on there. Um, are you, are you looking at that? And, and, and is the carrier looking at that? You know, that's a potential risk or threat area. Uh, and then obviously accuracy, you want to make sure that what you ordered is what you got. Uh, and you can check that on receipt. So I think uh, uh, Sabrina Merriman, our uh, logistics manager, uh, talked about some of those things in another webinar, and you can go check that out. But we'll talk about some mitigation uh, for uh, those potential risks and threats. And here's some practical examples. So you can have moldy pallets. You can um, uh, you can receive things that maybe there's a hole in the container or the trailer. You know, uh, you can have damaged boxes. You know, where they're torn, open to the environment. If you receive bulk, you know, is it is it coming to you um, the way it should, or or uh, did something happen along the way before it got to you, and somebody decided to put, you know, grain kind of just raw behind some two by fours in a container. Um, grain should generally come in a lined container in a lined food grade container so that's something to look out for uh, and there can be chemicals spilled on a pallet of product uh, this is a pretty it's hard to see on this but there was uh, i think some some lubricant some red lubricant that was spilled on this product so uh, these are all pictures that uh, i've collected uh, through working through different challenges uh, during my time at bsg and, and as we're moving along talking about risks and threats, uh, we have uh, risks and threats from the environment and activities, right? So uh, we talked about those uh, flaked and pre-milled and, and some of those other types of products. They're uh, generally more susceptible to moisture. Uh, if you're brewing, you're creating steam, there's gonna be a lot of moisture in the environment. Uh, you're dropping fermentation cones, uh, there's a lot of moisture in, in your facility. So that can be a challenge. Uh, a lot of breweries uh, I go to, I see that, you know, they're challenged with space. Um, you've selected a location uh, that's appropriate for the business uh, and it might be best for the business, but it's not always optimal for the um, uh, total amount of space that you have. And that can be a challenge. And that's a very real challenge. And it's, uh, it, it's, everything's a balance right so um moisture is definitely a challenge for breweries to store their their products and for bsg as well uh, uh we have to make sure that there's not leaks in the ceiling and, and so on and so forth but with a brewery you have uh you're creating moisture in the environment so that can be a challenge uh something we all face is neighboring businesses uh, you could have businesses next to you that uh are you know they're producing uh lots of odors they're uh stirring up dust or they have uh, their own pest management challenges uh, you know there's all sorts of different types of businesses out there that could negatively affect what you're doing in your operation and sort of the integrity of the ingredients that you store um, if we think of a strip mall or uh, a warehouse type of location you have neighbors that are on the other side of the wall uh, and what they do uh, really can affect you. Uh, and so we'll talk about some mitigation strategies there. Uh, you can have events on site, right? So that's one of those activities that can affect your ingredient storage. You know, DJs and bands, uh, I have down here, well, when we talk about neighboring businesses, I, I took this picture uh, or, or marketing took this picture from the RTC brewery. Uh, so that's a RAR technical center. Uh, and in the background, there's a malt production facility. So, you know, that can be that can be a challenge from a pest management standpoint. So that uh, poses a risk uh, for ingredient storage at the brewery because there's a big uh, facility producing uh, uh, food essentially. Um, so events on site such as DJs and bands. This is uh, one of our sales managers, uh, Ben Mosshart. So uh, you can have DJs and whatnot, which means uh, that you have uh, open roll-up doors, you have crowds bringing in foreign contaminants, 
and then you have crowds that have access to your storage areas. Uh, and I've seen crowds having access to your storage areas, uh, more so with uh, facilities that do uh, participation in festivals or weddings, generally where you have uh, more people during the daytime and maybe you're opening different parts of your facility up uh, than they would be at night when you have a band. Uh, um, so there could be people setting beers, drinks, their purses, food items on top of your ingredients if you're not controlling that properly. So that's that can be a challenge. And then animals. Okay. So a lot of our uh, a lot of our uh, operations are uh, your operations out there are animal friendly. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my dog and I at a brewery. Uh, so animals are coming into your facility, and that can be a challenge because, you know, they can wander off. Uh, they can bring some certain types of pests in, not generally that uh, you're going to be worried about. But, uh, you know, animals have a mind of their own. They're not as behaved as uh, uh, your typical customers in some cases and maybe more be behaved than others. Um, so moving on to kind of the last big category I have here is... Uh, uh, pests uh, are a potential risk or a threat. So um, we have rodent pests. Uh, there's there's different types of rodent pests, but the three primarily that I would worry about um, are Norway rats, roof rats, and mice. Uh, there's big differences in the way that these rodents can affect uh, your ingredient storage, right? So Norway rats are burrowers. Uh, they live in or on the ground. Uh, they can be large, and because they're large, it can be strong, and so they can push through screens. Um, they can chew through things, burrow through things, um, and they're also very smart. So uh, older rats can be uh, device or uh, uh, bait shy, so they they may or may not send uh, or wait and 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 send more adolescent rats in their community uh, into a situation that they are skeptical of. So rats, rats can be a challenge because they're, they're, uh, they're strong and they're smart and they burrow. Um, and roof rats are very similar to Norway rats, but they, they, they climb and they're smaller. Uh, and the big challenge there is that they can gain entry through places that you can't see from floor level. Generally, a roof rat is going to be uh, a more common issue in um, like California. Uh, so, so the far west coast might might see more of these uh, being a challenge. Uh, since they're smaller, they can get into some potentially smaller areas, you know, cracks or uh, areas of entry in the exterior of your building. Um, but they can climb. So there's a lot of places. Uh, overhead uh, on roofs or uh, where pipes are going from the exterior to the interior uh, that you might not see from ground level or floor level uh, and that's where the, the the roof rats can gain access to and then there's mice uh, mice can fit through uh, very very small holes and they can climb as well so if basically a mechanical pencil eraser uh, size hole is visible uh, or crack uh, a mouse can get through there. So they can collapse their body a little bit. They can uh, squeeze through incredibly small spaces. Um, so that's a little bit of background on, on rodents. And then the other sort of category of pests uh, that are of primary concern for us are stored product pests. Some people call them stored product insects, but uh, generally BSG, we call them stored product pests, SPPs for short. Uh, so they're very small insects, and they include weevils, moths, grain beetles, flower beetles, and others. Uh, they live uh, and breed and feed on stored food products. So we're we're talking about grains primarily here. Uh, there's some other ingredients that BSG distributes, you know, some sugars, some herbs and spices, or uh, what have you. But you know, generally we're talking about grain, and that's a lot of what. Uh, I, I think that we're going to keep in our mind here when we're talking about some of these challenges are, are with the grain uh, when we talk about stored product pests. Uh, the eggs can remain viable for up to two years in the environment or on food product. Uh, they have a variable length of life cycle uh, depending on the conditions. So 
hatching from an egg and then going to an adult that lays an egg, that cycle can occur anywhere between 20 days or 200 days or more. Uh, so these are agricultural products they are coming off the field. Uh, some of you may be buying unmalted uh, wheat, um, but if we think about malted grains, uh, some of the puffed or the flaked uh, ingredients, uh, some of those processes have a quote unquote validated kill step and some of those processes don't. Uh, so uh, there's a potential that ingredients inherently have uh, a susceptibility to having pests on them. Uh, kilning is very uh, hard on eggs uh, or, or adults. So generally it's a control step, but uh, it's not 100%. Kilning is not designed to be a, a pest control step. Kilning is designed to dry out grain. Uh, so there's always a potential with uh, malt that we supply uh, and certainly other malts out there uh, that there are you know, some life cycle of pests uh, in the product uh, that could become a challenge. Uh, so the life cycle, uh, life cycle proceeds from egg to larva to pupa to adult, uh, and then those adults lay eggs. Uh, so, you know, that's just a, good to understand kind of what their life cycle looks like. You may uh, see adults in your brewery, uh, and that's really the first time that you might uh, observe these or, uh, you know, in that larva or the pupa stage um, as well. Generally, you wouldn't see eggs. Uh, they're, they're really quite small. You would need a very good macroscope or microscope to be able to see those. And when we're talking about stored product uh, pests, they require moisture, right? So this goes back to uh, one of those environmental challenges. So uh, typically they cannot live or breed in products uh, and are on products that are below 8% moisture. And when we're talking about these, uh, you know, here's some visuals. Uh, this uh, picture on the top left is uh, a 30 power uh, jeweler's loop. And that's looking at a stored product insect uh, on on a on a bag, uh, the larger picture that looks like there's a bunch of peppers sprinkled on the floor. Uh, that was a picture that um, we received from a customer that uh, had a challenge at their facility. Uh, once it gets to this point, uh, you know that's pretty bad. Um, that would that would uh, represent a pretty bad infestation. Uh, and then uh, the bottom left photo, that's an Indian meal moth. Indian meal moths are a flying uh, stored product pest. Um, you'll generally see these flying around your facility is, is how you would notice them. You'd see something fly across and, and, and notice that uh, you, if you have uh, some devices to detect these, you'll notice them in those hanging pheromone monitors or those insect, insect light traps, but uh, just some visual aids there. As we continue to talk about stored product pests, uh, is it a weevil and why does it matter? Okay, so most of the time we receive uh, a complaint regarding pests, uh, it's reported as a weevil. Uh, and weevils are very different generally than what we see uh, associated with, uh, with grain. So weevils have a long snout that's uh, so looking at this picture on the left, there's that's a weevil, uh, and you'll notice that the weevil has antenna, but it also has a long snout um, coming off coming off its face. Uh, the picture on the right uh, is is a is a pest referred to as a uh, sawtooth grain beetle. Uh, it is also interchangeably referred to as a merchant grain beetle. Um, an entomologist would tell you that there's a difference. Uh, but an entomologist would also say that if you have a technician in your facility that says they can tell the difference between them, um, that that would be challenging because, you know, they don't have the microscopes and, and, and whatnot to be able to identify very, very minute differences between a sawtooth grain beetle and a merchant grain beetle. Um, in this case, we're looking at the serrated edge on uh, that middle segment there. Uh, the fact that it's a sawtooth grain beetle is not terribly important, but 
Uh, I just want to make the note here that there are different stored product uh, pests out there that affect grain. Um, the reason why it matters is uh, because treating them or or knowing uh, how they affect the product uh, uh, is different. So weevils burrow into the middle of uh, of a grain. They uh, deposit eggs inside of the grain. Uh, and so some of the mitigation strategies that you can control other uh, store product pests with, you can't control weevils with. Weevils are generally associated with raw grains. So that would be unmalted grains. Um, and they're, they're challenging, they're tough. They have a, they have a tough exterior. Uh, and uh, some of the products used to control store product pests don't uh, have as much uh, efficacy on weevils as they do with other sort of product pests. So we've talked about risks and threats. We can move into some mitigation. So when we talk about uh, uh, those risks and threats associated with uh, ingredients uh, in the receipt process, you know, when you're looking at your ingredients, uh, it is beneficial to have a HACCP plan. Uh, this is really something that uh, is not required by, uh, for breweries to have. Uh, it's not required by the FDA that there be a formal hazard analysis of these critical control points in your process, but it is good practice. Uh, and I would say that for breweries, distilleries, um, or, or winemaking processes, uh, the, 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 the detail isn't as important as uh, the general process of just saying, are you looking at what you're buying? Are you looking at how you store it? Are you looking at how you're using it? And are you trying to think uh, what risks are associated with those things? So I find as folks do those uh, sort of HASA planning or, uh, or HARP-C, uh, the hazard analysis for risk-based preventive controls is what the FDA would call it. That you're going to identify some challenges uh, that you that that you should uh, control for. Uh, uh, the MBAA has some resources on HACCP, and there's a link here, uh, but you can find that on the MBAA website. Uh, some other mitigation strategies are develop uh, procedures for receipt inspection, uh, provide appropriate tools to the folks that you have. Uh, performing those activities, train the folks uh, that are assigned to receive ingredients, and have them record the uh, receipt inspections. Uh, I think that's a that's a really strong mitigation strategy uh, to control for any risks or threats that are coming in with the ingredients. Right, so um, try to detect anything that's an issue right at the dock door or right at receiving. That way, you have a chance to contact your supplier which hopefully it's BSG right away uh, and work through it with them. Um, some other mitigation strategies are store ingredients according to their defined storage condition. Uh, different ingredients do have different defined storage conditions, right? So grain is different than hops uh, and, uh, and yeast and so on and so forth. So really understand those uh, uh, storage requirements. And, you know, some of that might be identified uh, when you, do your hassle planning. Shelf life versus turnover. Um, you know, grain has a long shelf life generally. Uh, some of those flaked, uh, torrified, um, puffed ingredients, pre milled ingredients, they have a shorter shelf life. Uh, but I think it's important to understand shelf life versus turnover. Uh, BSG has a lot of. Um, capability to store and protect ingredients uh, differently than maybe your brewery has because you have some of those uh, those challenges, right? This goes back to the environment and activities, right? You, you chose your brewery because it was good for the overall business. You didn't choose it because it's the optimal storage condition. So understand that just because a product has a shelf life doesn't mean that you want to always store it in your facility for that amount of time. Uh, generally, the quicker you can go through product, the better. Uh, or, you know, one way to look at this is uh, stock your brewery lean and depend on the supplier to deliver 
in in uh, um, in a short lead time, right? So understand what the lead times are. Understand kind of when it's optimal during the week to talk to your customer service representative to say, hey, uh, it, you know, what's the best time of the week to order if I need stuff overnight or same day or uh, can I, you know, pick it up and whatnot and turn that, you know, turn that product over quickly. Uh, th that's a good mitigation strategy for anything that might be associated particularly with the, uh, with the ingredients. And then lastly, you know, I have on here purchase from suppliers with robust quality and food safety programs. Uh, do your suppliers have uh, GFSI certification? So that stands for Global Food Safety Initiative Certifications. Uh, this is kind of a, a opportunity just to talk about BSG um, and Shakopee has a, a FSSC 22000 certification, which means that, that we've been benchmarked uh, against kind of the global standard for food safety. Um, not all suppliers are equal. Uh, it's just good to talk to uh, your supplier about what are they doing? Do they have food safety programs? Do they have some of these uh, mitigation strategies themselves, right? So uh, we're a supply chain, right? All the way from uh, the malt producer to you as the end uh, user. And so, we're only as strong in that chain as the weakest link. Uh, and just make sure that you're talking to your supplier and understand uh, what programs they have in place. Uh, this is some visual aids for, for mitigation. Uh, so receipt inspections, uh, are you looking at seals? Uh, do you have um, jewelers loops? If you are seeing uh, some pests that might be a concern to be able to inspect them more closely. Uh, it, is it a stored product insect or is it a piece of dust, uh, right? Uh, do you have forms? Uh, do you have adequate lighting? Uh, BSG uh, checks pallet moisture. Uh, checking pallet moisture might not be appropriate for uh, your operation, but what are some other things that might be appropriate to your operation that you don't see here? You know, start thinking about those things. Uh, you can catch those issues. Uh, uh, ahead of time uh, before things are sitting in your brewery uh, for an extended period of time. So how do pallets look uh, when they're shipped by BSG, right? So they're stacked neatly within the confines of the pallet footprint. Uh, that's to reduce damage. Um, pallets are in good condition. Uh, they should be coming with a tag that says inspect immediately. Uh, uh, there should be no damage or torn bags. Uh, they should have a packing slip, some food safety information. And I have on here just some notable items in this picture. Um, the dock doors in this picture have uh, brushes, right? So there's brushes on the bottom to uh, mitigate pest entry in, into the storage facility. Uh, the dock leveler has brushes. Um, the dock door is in good condition. I don't see any light uh, in this picture. Uh, there's no outside light that I can observe from inside the facility. And there's a clean floor, which just means that there's no looser spilled grains, which pests could have access to. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, mitigation strategies uh, for challenges with the environment and activities. Uh, are dry ingredients such as mulch stored out of humid or wet environments? That can be a challenge, uh, but think about how you might organize your brewery if you have a very small facility uh, to be able to just maximize kind of uh, the distance between um, things producing steam or water uh, and your your ingredients. Um, do you know your neighbors? Have you evaluated the potential uh, risks or threats that their operations pose? So, um, you know, at BSG, our warehouse uh, managers, our DC managers are encouraged if they share a wall with the neighbor to get to know the neighbor, understand their operation, understand kind of what their pest management programs look like uh, and and just keep tabs on that. There might be turnover of management for your neighbors. Uh, it's good to know your neighbors. Um, do you have uh, written good manufacturing processes, uh, practices? Uh, these are known as GMP. So do you have sanitation procedures? Are they recorded? Um, do you have, you know, hand washing? Um, are you evaluating uh, 
if you're going to have a festival, do you have, you know, hazard analysis kind of procedures to, to say, okay, we're going to have this festival. Uh, let's document uh, how we're going to control our facility during that. Um, do you have control of access to ingredients, especially during events, right? So something to think about. Uh, do you keep overhead doors open? Uh, are your ingredients separated from open air environments? So some breweries have the capability to have a, a wall between uh, their tap room and their ingredient storage. Some people don't. Um, if you wanna have overhead doors open, there may be times during the year where it's a particular challenge. Uh, where it's particularly hot, humid after rains uh, in the spring when things are breeding. Uh, so those are all things to think about. Uh, so mitigation strategies for pest management. Uh, we can talk about integrated pest management, which basically means, um, you know, do you have a service provider? Uh, are they knowledgeable about stored product pests? I find that there are a lot of folks servicing breweries out there that are not knowledgeable uh, regarding stored product pests. Um, and that can, uh, that can be a financial risk for, for your brewery because they may uh, be selling you services that are geared towards ants um, and they may be treating uh, your, your uh, operation as if ants are a primary threat. Ants are very different than stored product pests. Um, so just making sure that you have a service provider, if you're currently paying a service provider uh, <clears throat> that is knowledgeable about stored product pests, are they national? Uh, national service providers generally have um, more capability than local service providers. Are they uh, specific to food environments? Um, not all service providers have a food specific uh, team, so they may be uh, servicing some residential accounts, uh, hotels, hospitals, and then coming to your facility and your facility is kind of a food handling facility. Uh, those other environments aren't the same. So does the technician have the specific knowledge to help you uh, or are they more geared towards someone like uh, a hotel that's primarily concerned with like bed bugs, right? So just understanding who that technician is and do they have uh, food specific experience. Uh, and do they perform crack and crevice treatment, fogging, fumigation applications? Uh, so understanding if they have those capabilities is important. So uh, 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 the service provider should know about integrated pest management, but really integrated pest management has to do with exclusion, monitoring, uh, and then some of those uh, mitigation. So uh, all those GMPs, the receipt process, right? all those things, but then also some of this crack and crevice treatment, fogging, fumigation, uh, th those all uh, play into it. Exclusion is the best practice. Uh, so keeping pests out, that's why it's important to uh, make sure that you're not receiving products that are affected by stored product insects or rodents. Uh, you don't have uh, holes in your wall if you're trying to keep uh, stored product pests out of your storage facility. Uh, so exclusion is the best uh, policy, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about monitoring here. Some more visual aids. Uh, do you have numbered pheromone monitors? Uh, so we have dome style, we have hanging style pheromone monitors, and what those are? Uh, it's a pheromone. It's an attractant uh, that is specific to these pests. Uh, the the pests are looking for those when they want to interact with. Uh, 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 pests of the opposite sex, so they're trying to go find a mate. Um, and so some people call them traps, but they're really just monitors. They're for early detection, right? Um, to let you know if you have uh, a problem that might uh, become a larger problem, you may uh, get some stored product insects in these monitors. Um, they're sticky. The pest crawls into them or flies into them. They get stuck. Uh, the technician looks at those or your own employees can look at those and you determine, uh, do we have ingredients near these uh, that may have some pests in them? Uh, they're generally effective for, I think, uh, 50 feet or so. Um, in a brewery, generally, depending on size, a couple of these would go a long way. 
uh, if you're a very large brewery, uh, your technician can help you determine how many of these you should have. Uh, there's insect light traps or ILTs, uh, multi-rodent traps uh, or multi-catch traps as some people call them. Those are an interior device. Uh, so they're looking for if you have rodents inside of your facility. Uh, and then there's exterior bait stations. Uh, the exterior bait stations do have uh, some bait blocks which have a poison in them. They're not made to poison uh, rodents. Um, that is a side effect. They're made to monitor for rodents. So the technician will go around, they'll open them up, and they'll look for evidence of pests. So they'll look for droppings, they'll look for uh, materials that rodents bring in uh, to create nests, and they'll look for gnawing on the bait block. So they're a monitoring device, they're not a poison device. That's a byproduct of using those. Uh, you can use them without bait blocks. Pests will go to those because they feel safe in them. Uh, so if, if you don't want to use bait in them, uh, they would have some limited uh, efficacy for, for detecting if you have rodents on the exterior of your facility. So uh, uh, when things go wrong, uh, so after implementing the mitigation strategies we discussed, right, so all those things that you can do, uh, things can still go wrong. Uh, and when they go wrong, what, what, you, what should you consider doing? Uh, so I would say stop, assess the situation, perform some type of an investigation to try to determine the scope of the issue. So uh, if we're thinking about pests, are we talking about um, one bag? or is the entire facility um, affected? If we're talking about um, uh, damage, is it, is it one bag on a pallet, or is it all the bags on a pallet, or is it the whole load? Uh, if you're receiving product, does the trailer smell uh, unusual? Did it drop off some odiferous pet food immediately before uh, uh, picking up uh, the ingredients that you're gonna receive, right? So. Those are all things to consider. We would generally catch those at BSG if that were to happen, uh, but things do get cross docked at uh, different carrier facilities. So, you know, uh, um, determine how much, you know, quantity of uh, ingredients is affected, the timeline, who was involved, uh, who in your operation noticed it first and when, uh, and what did they do? Uh, and all that is being done to try to determine the potential root cause. You might not know root cause, but uh, um, you can try to narrow it down to, um, especially if you have multiple suppliers, oh, uh, a pest or, you know, whatever might have come from one supplier or another. Are you able to de determine that? And that uh, gives you a great deal of information to be able to go back and talk to your supplier. Uh, so gather and document all that relevant information in an organized manner. Um, you know, try to put the story together. Uh, uh, in a concise, organized way. Uh, obtain any samples or pictures if that's appropriate. And then if it's a BSG ingredient, contact your BSG sales manager or customer service representative. Uh, we may have some questions for you. Uh, we may have some forms that we ask you to complete um, that help out with our investigation and to what might have gone wrong here. Uh, and, and remember, we're all in this together. Uh, when when things go wrong, we can talk about that back and forth. We can try to figure out uh, what to do next, right? So um, if you identify something, don't think that it's nothing, let us know. Uh, and, and you know, the more information we have, the better continual improvement we can do. I have some resources on here. There's some resources on the BSG website. Uh, the MBAA has some resources. I included a link to uh, the trace store guard pest identification poster. If you Google trace uh, store guard, you can go on and learn more about those devices. Those are those uh, pheromone monitors. And then also uh, your BSG sales manager or customer service representative are always available to help you. Uh, so that's kind of uh, me talking at you. And I think Jake, we can get back to some uh, question and answer here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Brandon. This is some really good stuff. Um, we've got uh, a question that came in. I think it's a good one. It's um, it's sort of uh, worst case scenario. 
if an entire silo full of malt has a bug infestation, what options would a brewery have to, to, to deal with that situation? So in those cases, uh, it depends on how bad the infestation is. Uh, and that's something that may be a team effort between uh, your master brewer, uh, pest technician, uh, or maybe potentially some resources at BSG or, or RAR or another supplier. Um, if it's bad enough to where it's changed, uh, really the analytics, uh, so the protein makeup or the starch availability uh, of, of the malt because the pests are consuming uh, the malt. Uh, they're changing really what that analytics would look like. They're consuming starches. They're consuming potentially some of the protein content there. It's going to affect how that malt performs uh, if the infestation is bad enough. Uh, if it's a fairly minor uh, amount of stored product pests in there, uh, it generally it may be usable. Uh, you may be able to make beer out of it. Uh, Store product pests are not generally thought of as a food safety hazard in brewing. Um, they're not associated with uh, pathogens. So uh, it, it would not be a concern in, in that aspect if there were few enough of them. So it, uh, early detection is best, and that's where we talk about that turnover. Turn your ingredients over. You have less likelihood for um, these things to get so out of hand that it wouldn't mean that the ingredients are unusable. I've got um, something that I, I guess said that you started talking about, you know, dealing with humidity or, you know, whether it's ambient or, you know, whether, or you're creating the, the, the conditions, you know, maybe gives, I would, I would curious to hear your thoughts. Like what are some of the challenges from a geographic perspective? Like, Challenges that that breweries in the you know upper Northwest or upper Midwest versus you know someplace like Houston or or Florida. What are some of those challenges that differ by geography? Yeah, so uh, you know you you talked about different regions of the United States. Um, they have very different climates. Uh, so like Colorado is very dry. Um, uh, California, within California, you have very different climates there. Uh, and then the Southeast, obviously, uh, you know, we have customers that uh, they're making beer and outside their brewery, they might have rice patties. So it's uh, hot, humid. It's, it's some of the bit most challenging. So in those cases where it's hot, humid, where you geographically are located, uh, I would say lean on BSG to carry that inventory for you. Uh, work with your customer service uh, representative to uh, figure out, you know, kind of what you're ordering and when those ingredients show up and, and try to run as lean on uh, uh, inventory as possible at your brewery. Uh, in some of the other locations, yeah, you can get by with storing those ingredients longer. Um, temperature control is always an option. So if you have a large cooler uh, and you have some of those flaked uh, uh, or puffed pre-milled ingredients, um, you can put those in your cooler if you have room. Uh, and and uh, pest activity is directly related to kind of uh, temperature. Uh, if it's good for you and your babies, it's good for pests and their babies. Uh, generally, you wouldn't want to live uh, in a cooler. Uh, so if you have a specially sensitive product or aging product and you have room in your cooler, put it in a cooler. It'll, it'll keep it fresh for longer. Gotcha. How does that, and I suppose that that also plays into seasonality as well. Are the times of years, you know, that we, we see more pest issues and then other times it's less of a concern? So yeah, generally when it gets warmer, you're going to, you know, be at, at, at more risk. Uh, late summer, early fall is when you will kind of see the most activity uh, if, if you're prone to this. Um, so these pests can exist in the environment uh, as well. So generally that's, that's when we uh, at BSG, uh, start to ramp up um, inspections. You know, we'll do some exterior treatment uh, to our facilities to make sure that things aren't migrating inside. As the nights become cooler and the days are warmer, those pests try to go inside, and and that and that's rodents and everything else as well. So, uh, you know, there's some seasonality. We have seen customers. If you have a silo that you have a hard time running through all that product, we have seen customers carry inventory in a silo through early summer, uh, empty it, and then 
not order for that silo again until the weather really gets cold and they'll supplement with uh, maybe super sex uh, in that highest risk time of year. Gotcha. Gotcha. It sounds like it's just so much, it's, as you said, kind of early in the talk, it's so much about understanding the environment in which you have the brewery. Like you said before, no one's really choosing a brewery for its storage capabilities. I mean, maybe just in a general sense, it's got places to put the ingredient, but not maybe that's not a immediate concern when looking at a property or, or thinking about how things are configured. Um, what, I, I guess this is kind of, I'll just throw this one out there. What, I mean, from your experience with BSG so far, what have you seen, you know, from breweries, what have you, what are the most common things that, that, that you have seen, uh, whether by product or, you know, environment or type of pest? Uh, be a challenge in storage. Yeah. Like what, you know, what has been the most common thing to hear from breweries and is it, is it, you know, we're dealing with rats all the time or, you know, we're dealing with weevils or it's this sort of thing. So I think that the breweries that have the most challenge uh, with storage of ingredients are the breweries that have everything all in one room under one roof, right? So if you walk into that brewery and there is a yellow chain uh, dividing the tap room from the brewing space and the brewing space is uh, immediately adjacent to the storage area. Uh, it's all under one roof. There's, there's no walls dividing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, those, those customers are gonna have the most challenge uh, and they're uh, most likely to have the roll-up style doors. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that can, that can play into them having some pest management challenges. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if they start to get stored product pests, uh, that can be the most challenging because, uh, by the time you, you, uh, if you don't have the proper monitoring in place, by the time you find it, you're concerned that your whole inventory is affected. Uh, sure. and then the other things in that environment that, that are a challenge are the moisture, right? Everything's under one roof. So if, if you're, uh, making steam, uh, in the brewing process, your ingredients are subjected to more, to more moisture. So those are the most challenged environments and those environments uh, benefit the most from some very fundamental, some very simple. Uh, I would try to do it as cost effective as possible, but to try to have some pest management uh, from, a, from a, a good service provider in place. Yeah. And it, it sounds like, as you said, exclusion being one of the major, you know, just don't let it get in there in the first place that the more open your space is, the more mixed use it is, it's harder to execute that component of the, of the plan. But like you said, there are ways to, to mitigate that. Um, well, those are the questions we had, Brandon. Thank you so much for your time today. This is really great. Um, to all of you out there, this of course is being recorded. So it'll be available via our YouTube channel, which is linked on the BSG craft slash webinars page. So you can go back and look at it. Uh, please go to our webinars page and, and register for the upcoming webinars. We've got some good ones coming up. And uh, Brandon, thank you again for your time and, and everybody cheers and have a great weekend. Okay, cheers. Have a good weekend. Stay safe, everyone.